I'm John Michael Bailey, and welcome to the Wellspring Digital Chat, where we uh, go out into the wild with a trank gun. We uh, find a marketer. We, uh, you know, it's painless. They don't even know it happens. We trank them. We take them back to uh, to our camp. We uh, we remove their brains. We extract all the digital knowledge, all the great knowledge, all the facts and tips and everything, and then we put it back in and we release them back into the wild. They'll find they don't. Well, we we tag them, but they don't know anything's going on. Anyway, today we have uh, one of my very favorite authors, and what I like to call a thoughtful marketer. Uh, he is another one of my very favorite people, bloggers, authors, speakers, marketers, and educator. Uh, Mark, please go ahead and introduce yourself to these wonderful people. Oh, thanks, John Michael. It's great uh, being with you again. And yeah, I was wondering what that strange numbing pain in my butt <laughs> was. And uh, the that will go away after a while. little while. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for using the anesthesia. It, yeah. It's such a humane manner. <laughs> uh, I think you did a good job with, with the introduction. I mean, I, I, I really thrive on helping people with marketing strategy. Uh, I'm really proud of the work I do as an educator at Rutgers University. And, uh, you know, hopefully as the pandemic subsides, I'll be able to be that keynote speaker again. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> we're, you know, we're hoping on that soon. And, and I, I love, you know, writing books. I've had a lot of fun uh, writing books. Um, Cumulative Advantage is number nine. And, uh, you know, who knows if there'll be another one. I got to have another big idea, but it's it's been a great experience. Well, known marketing rebellion, content code, uh, and now cumulative advantage. And and I struggle with that word, so bear with me. Cumulative. <laughs> You're not uh, the only one. I my found. mouth doesn't work that well. Um, <laughs> they're always, you know, those books, the, the three previous are always on the top of my list. And, and now uh, cumulative advantage is going to be on the top of the list. They're all great books. Um, they're, they're not... Uh, they're, they're all relatively quick reads, and I don't mean that to, to sort of uh, uh, discount them. I just mean that in, in the sense that they have really well-written flow and uh, right. lots of great stuff in there. So um, I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. Uh, no pressure to you, of course. <laughs> so let's do this. So uh, in Known, uh, which I will put a link in here uh, to that book, you talk about human content. Uh, which I don't think there is simply enough of. Uh, mm -hmm. Specifically, it is content that you say is vulnerable, personal, bold, unguarded, generous, and confident. But how on earth does a marketing director pitch this concept to their boss? <laughs> well, anytime someone says, I need to convince my boss of something, that's always a red flag for yeah. me. Um, and... Uh, because I think that leaders, great leaders and progressive leaders, they, they're open to new ideas and they, they, they want to be at the forefront. They want to keep moving ahead. I mean, anybody that's made it in business today knows that you've got to change and you've got to change fast. And to me, the idea of really human content is, is intuitive. I mean, I think if you went to your boss and said, okay, here's our latest press release. And here's a bit of content in our industry that, that went viral that we think is particularly uh, well done and interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. chances are there's something special about that content. And it, it, we're all human beings. And intuitively, we, we, we like content that's entertaining that has some sort of human story that has some emotion behind it. And that's hard for a lot of companies to grasp um, because we're sort of, you know, legal led instead of human led a lot of the time. And that, you know, and I, and it's nothing against the legal profession. I mean, we need, we need those people to keep us out of jail. There are, there are friends, right. But at the same time, you know, I saw a study done by um, BuzzSumo, and they said that the, the word most associated 
with content that goes viral is awe. A-W-E, awe. Mm -hmm. It's like you've seen something you've never seen before. There's a, there's a, there's a magical quality to it. There's, uh, there's something entertaining about it. And most of us in marketing don't sit around thinking, how can we be more entertaining today? But that really is kind of the idea, right? We, we want to ha get content that people will not only enjoy, but they'll eat, maybe even pursue be, and they'll subscribe to us and they'll want more of it. So, you know, it, it, it's not going to happen everywhere because really that is led by the culture of your company. Mm. Some, some co company cultures just aren't going to get there. But, um, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I think a lot is changing because the world is so competitive and to compete, you've got to have a new view of, of your content. I think it's to the point now where, where it's, well, it's getting to the point, in my opinion, where, where some companies don't have a choice but to sort of humanize their brand and humanize their content if they want to succeed. Um, you know, some fight it tooth and nail, but uh, I, I hope that, I'm, I'm optimistic like you. I hope we're going to see more. And more yeah, I think the word sort of has been um, kind of bastardized in some ways. I wrote a blog post maybe a year or so ago saying that um, that human content is kind of like a grape lollipop <laughs> today. So if you think about a grape lollipop, it's really not grape. Yeah. <laughs> Someone in the industrial food complex decided one day that this is going to be what a grape candy tastes like. Right. And it has this bizarre purple color. So that signals it's going to be grape. And you've been conditioned to think, oh, this flavor of my mouth is grape, but it really isn't. Yeah. And I think that's the same way marketing is kind of with human content these days is that just because like we slap someone's name on the top, like we think it's personalized now that that makes it right. human. And it's, it's, it's really not as grape. <laughs> yeah. It's industrial grape. <laughs> Agreed. Definitely a, a different, uh, a different thing altogether, but to continue on this, the, the, in marketing rebellion, your other book, uh, mm -hmm. you talk about artisanal marketing. So you describe it in the book as marketing that is so compellingly authentic, believable, and natural that people want to carry your story forward. So yeah. can, can you further define artisanal marketing and, and talk about why you think it's so important today? Well, I think one uh, example of this would be, let's take a look at a uh, Instagram feed. And um, so Instagram has a certain feel to it you expect human pictures and mm -hmm. you know sunsets and dogs and food and that's kind of the organic experience of instagram and it's normally really really easy to see the sponsored content because it's an ad right? right now the people doing a thing oh we're on instagram but you're not really on instagram it's an ad. You might as well take out an ad on TV or at a magazine. Generally speaking, people are going to flip right through it because it's so obvious. It's not organic to the experience. And I think the best type of content for a company on Instagram or anywhere is content that's organic to the experience, right? It's something that you expect. It fits in the flow. It fits in your community. It's not a surprise. It's not easy to skip over because it sort of says, oh, what's this? So I don't know if artisanal is, is the best word. A lot of people don't like that word. It's another one of those ones that, that have been <laughs> over overused. Um, and I couldn't really think of a, maybe I should have called you, John Michael. You're the words <laughs> you hear to come up with a better word than artisanal. But it's something, you know, today there's this huge, huge trend toward appreciating things that are local and handcrafted and real. So, you know, it, it's just traditional advertising is just so counter to that. It's counter to everything people want, everything they expect today. And I think there's a way to create uh, marketing content that seems like it fits, that it just fits in my life. It fits in my style. It, it, it fits in my community. And it's something that it's kind of accepted. I'm kind of um, really 
uh, loving how some of these podcasters, like the the you know Dax Shepard or or, um, or there's one uh, called Smartless, uh, mm. and and they do their ads, but they do their ads in the same way that they're they're doing their podcast. It's them. Right. It's right. you know they're using humor or they're using they're personalizing it, and it doesn't feel as much like an ad. And that to me is it's almost. It's almost like going back in time where ads were more uh, not so trying to be so clever, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I mean, we do that on our podcast, too. Uh, I have a show called The Marketing Companion, and we have sponsors. And it's almost like the radio days is you say, hey, right. you know, the, you know, speaking of that, well, you know, I found this out because we use this product. Mm -hmm. And it, it is organic because... I don't promote anything that I don't use and I don't believe in. In fact, there was a, an advertiser, uh, we kicked off the show <laughs> because they were doing some things we didn't, we didn't believe in and we were getting some bad feedback and we didn't want to be part of that brand. In fact, like maybe a year later, they've even come back to us. They said, are we still in jail? <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, the answer was, yes, you are, because it, you, it, it's just, uh, it, it, it has to be organic. It has to be something that we believe in. So we, we curate advertisers just like you would curate content. We create our promotions just with as much passion and as much thought as we would, you know, you know uh, as we would prepare for, you know, the topics on our show. It, and I think that also speaks to the content on your show as well, because the, the, the advertiser, you know, you flip the script, the advertisers are now begging you, you know, to let them uh, be a part of that experience because the content on the show is so good and they want to advertise with you. And, and, and I hope more of that happens, <laughs> you know, the, the de yeah. democratization of, of uh, advertising would be fantastic. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. And, and I think it also sort of, hints john michael at the power of of influencers where mm. you know like i have a certain amount of influence over my audience but it's it's not you know by association these products are 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 believed because people believe in me and they know that i'm not going to promote anything that's um you know that's not in their best interests yep so on to your new book which i loved mm -hmm. Uh, cumulative you. advantage. Uh, I just finished it this weekend. It is amazing. I highly recommend it. Um, I, I'm going to kind of gloss over some concepts here, but I love the idea of gaining advantage using countervailing processes. This seems to be uh, a very common theme in a lot of your work. I, I, yeah, I, I kind saw, of is. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a lot of that in Content Code and Known and in Marketing yeah. Rebellion. Um, can you describe this concept uh, for? you know, these people and, and sort of go into its importance? Yeah, I, I think it is part of a common theme. It, it, and it's something I realized myself where I'm always like trying to beat the, the other, the big guys, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to punch back. The David of the marketing world. Yeah, right. I'm the David of the marketing world. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the idea really behind the book is that doggone? It's just so hard to compete today, mm. and uh, we we've sort of lost the this this opportunity of equity of the internet. I mean, everything is being is is coming together again, where you know the internet sort of like threatened big media companies, right. and now the internet is dominated by big media companies again, right? And so all of the content we're trying to produce is just getting buried, even if we're great, even if we're doing our best work. And I'm not the kind of guy to say, oh, well, life is hard. We got to go, you know, move on to something else. I want to figure it out. And it led me to this idea of, of momentum. If you're stuck, if you've sort of plateaued, what do you do to move to the next level? And this led me to research that really started in the 1960s in the field of sociology that kind of looked at how does it happen that some people just seem to have unstoppable momentum? They just go and go and go and go and everything they touch turns to gold and some of us just are always left behind. I found this fascinating. So long story short, this 
famous uh, sociologist, Robert Merton, came across this idea of cumulative advantage. And he said, look, if people have an initial advantage and they sort of play their cards in a certain way, they're going to create this unstoppable momentum unless there are countervailing processes. So I became obsessed with this idea. What are the countervailing processes? He didn't freaking tell us. <laughs> and I went through all his writing. I went through all his speeches. Thanks, Robert. And, and by the way, this idea has been proven in business and in, and, and in athletics and in education and in every kind of field. So, I mean, this is really something that works, but it hasn't been applied to normal people like us in normal businesses. Mm. So I, I went to his, his son. His son, ironically, won the Nobel Prize in economics. And, and, and you got to read the Robert, book to know Robert, why it's ironic. Robert yeah, Merton's great. work was done on Nobel Prize winners. Yeah. I don't think that's a coincidence, right? Right, right? I think he passed this on to his son. This is how you do it, boy. <laughs> now, so I, so I contacted his, his son. I said, I got to know. I'm writing this book that features your dad. What are these countervailing processes? He said, well, he said, I'm not really the person you need to talk to. You need to talk to my stepmother. She was the research assistant who did the work. And she still teaches at Columbia University. So I contacted her. She said, oh, I'm so glad you contacted me. Here are all my unpublished papers. Oh. On this topic, this will help get you to where you need to go. So she was very kind and helpful. You know, it was hard going through a lot of this stuff because it's sort of very academic and very ethereal in a lot of ways. But, you know, I was able to, you know, plow through it and, and find some stuff that helped. So I think, you know, I nailed it. I think we, we sort of came up with this process that says, look, this is how it works in the real world. And you don't necessarily have to be special. You don't need a Harvard degree. You don't need a million dollars. You just really need to be aware mm. of how momentum works. This is the process. One of the things I think is most powerful, most inspiring in the book is that on the, on the uh, uh, Bloomberg list of the richest people in the world, there are 10 people on that list that had grew up in poverty, absolute poverty, had no college education, and they all did the same thing to get where they were, right? They sort of followed this idea. They followed this process, and, and that's what's codified in this book. And, and so to, to kind of take it to the next step, then you, you, you have a process that you outline in the book, which I think is great. Yeah. And, and it's one of the themes throughout all your books is, is you usually have a process that, mm -hmm. that people can understand and follow, which I, I really appreciate because I'm not very smart. So uh, it's nice to have things spelled out for me sometimes. <laughs> but uh, um, one of the, another concept in the book is finding the seam. So yeah. a way to cut through the noise, uh, get some big wins in marketing. Um, how might someone sell this to a team or management or whatever who is just head down focused on daily tasks, goals, KPIs, and all that corporate crap? Yeah. Do we get too obsessed with with what everyone else is doing marketing in marketing and, and, and you know, therefore get lost in sort of this sameness? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is really this idea of the seam is is really the heart of innovation, the heart of, of opportunity. Um, let me give you, first I'll explain what, what it is. So the idea is, the first step is looking at what is your, what could be an initial advantage for you? What are your skills? What are your resources? What are your ideas? You know, what's your perspective? What's your energy? What's your, it could be almost anything, right? Sometimes it's like who you know. Sometimes it's like being in the right place at the right time creates this advantage. And then you think about now, the, no idea is going to lead to momentum unless you pursue it. Right. it there's, it's sort of a quest to say, how does this concept or advantage or idea, how does it apply to something relevant going on in the world today? Not next year, not two years from now, but what is happening right now? A seam is, is a shift in the status quo. 
It's a change. It's a new trend. Something going on with demographics, something going on with taste, something going on with fashion or economics or the world. And the reason why this is particularly relevant right now is because we are living in the greatest shift in the status quo in the history of the world. It's called a pandemic. Yep. Literally, everything in the world is being reimagined, how we work, how we entertain ourselves, how we educate our children, how we date, how we eat, how we do almost, how we travel or not travel. It's, it, it, it's, everything is changing. And a lot of that is going to be permanent, right? Millions and millions of people are going to work remotely. Okay. So now what's a seam? What's an opportunity? What are the needs? What are the unmet and underserved needs of people who remote work remotely? Well, they could be working at all times of hours, you know, hours of, of the day. How are they going to get their food all hours of the day? What about child care? What if they have a sick child? What about working out? They might have to work out at weird hours. You know, could you build a remote working apartment complex? Could you build a remote working hub? Could, you know, there's just every single shift creates opportunity. And this is happening every single day, every minute of the day. There are, there are little things percolating and bubbling, and we just need to be aware of these things. So uh, let me give you an example from my own life that um, when the pandemic hit, uh, I got COVID and I, I, I really had, I had hypoxia. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't think. I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my brain. And when I finally sort of awakened from this haze, I realized my business had gone to zero. Right. You know, my speaking had dried up. My my consulting customer said, "We love you, but not right now." Um, even my book sales dropped to to nearly zero. And so I had to think, "All right, what do I do? You know, what's my role in the world? What's what's my initial advantage? My advantage is I am a teacher. I am a really good teacher. I can take very complicated concepts and distill them to the, their essence and help people understand. And what I realized, John Michael, is that what the world needed me to teach in that moment, in that time, was something different. Hmm. I stopped creating marketing content and I started creating content about how do we get through this thing? How do we deal with this disorientation, anxiety? How's it working on me? How do we deal with this uncertainty when we don't know when it's going to end? Right. We don't know what's going to change. And many people said the content I produced in this period was the, the most helpful content they saw during this period. The traffic to my website doubled. So I took some of this content, made it into an ebook called Fight to the Other Side, gave it away for free. The last page of the ebook said, if you loved this ebook and were inspired by it, just think what Mark Schaefer could do for your boring Zoom meetings. <laughs> right now, here's the unmet need. Everybody has these leadership meetings every week. Right. They're right. boring. What do we do? We need someone to come in and, and inspire us and give us hope, right? John Michael, by July, August, I was having record months. That's I went from, I went and, and look, it didn't last. Sure. Right? Because it's a seam. You know, it, it's good. It, it may boom. It may happen for a year. It may happen for two years. But people are moving away from that, right? They don't need me to do that. So you have to be looking for the next seam. It's not a five-year plan. It's not a 250-page document. It's what can I do right now to create opportunity? And that's the way we need to view the world to create strategy today. And, you know, it's, you know, it's a flanking maneuver and in, in a yeah. sense, you know, it's, a, you know, you're, you're facing a, a, a huge challenge head on and, you know, maybe it's time to sneak around the side. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and all of this, uh, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, in your book, in all your books, but specifically in this one, there's, there's a consistent theme about hard work. 
and that none of this comes easy. It's not as if you go and, you know, companies are always talking about they want that next hit or instant success or the, the viral video, you know. Your story, your personal story is one of hard work. I think most successful marketers' stories are, are, are those of hard work. And, and you say there's, you say in the book, there's no substitute for consistent and steady progress. Um, mm -hmm. Should the marketers, you know, today pay more attention to the importance of the long game in marketing? Well, it's really a balance, you know? I mean, uh, you know, sometimes you've got to, you've, the, the clock's ticking, right? I mean, you're a startup and you've got so much money and, uh, you know, you need to look at the long term. Certainly you need to build your brand in a smart way, but maybe you've got to make something happen and you've got six months or nine months to do it. So you've got to think about, um, influencers. You've got to, you know, that's borrowing an audience basically, <laughs> You've got to maybe think about using advertising in a smart way, digital advertising. That's borrowing, you know, borrowing an audience until you can establish your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think for, you know, for an individual trying to create, create a personal brand, for a business trying to create a, a meaningful brand in the long term and, and create an audience of people that really connect to them. I mean, there's just no shortcut. I haven't seen one. I haven't found one when I... When I wrote Known, I, I really would have loved to have written a book that said how to, how to build an effective, powerful brand in 60 days or 30 days or 10 days, you know, <laughs> but that would be a lie. Right. And uh, there's too many people out there, you know, promising quick success. And look, you know, I, I went down this deep rabbit hole when I wrote Known and I interviewed 97 people around the world who are known in their field real estate or wealth management or education or music or whatever there was no exception none the people did basically the same four things that i outlined in the book but it's about creating this this meaningful content being patient engaging with your audience finding the right audience that matters to you nurturing them and rewarding them and and it just takes time uh, there, there's a story I tell in this book, and I, I, I tell it a lot because it, it had a big impact on me. About uh, seven years into their career, I got to meet the Black Keys, huge rock band, one of the biggest rock bands in the world. You know, they can fill Madison Square Gardens. When I got to meet them, they had just had a, their biggest hit. They were playing a club held, you know, maybe a thousand people, something mm -hmm. like that. And I said, what was the big turning point? What was the thing that really helped you burst through? And Patrick Carney, the drummer said, there wasn't one. Look, we've been making records for seven years. We've been touring for seven years. Every record's a little bit better than the last one. Every tour is a little bit better than the last one. We just keep working. We just keep engaging with people. We just keep you know, trying to get a little bit better month by month and year by year. And that was at a point where I was working on my personal brand and I wanted it to explode. Mm -hmm. And what he was telling me is it doesn't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and as, but as long as you see progress, and I spend a lot of time talking about this in the book, as long as you see progress, you gotta keep going mm. because, you know, because it's working. It might not seem like it's working, but it is. And you got, and it, you know, might, might take two years, might take three years in some cases. But as long as you're seeing progress, you know, it's going to tip up and start to take off. I love the fact that you quoted a drummer in your book, mainly uh, because I'm a drummer as well, and I'm actually cool. recording this interview sitting on my drum throne because it <laughs> keeps me from <laughs> rocking back and forth and doing all the fidgety things that I normally do. Right. So. <laughs> Good for you. That's fun. Yeah. So, Mark, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, like I said, I enjoy all your books. Uh, they're all helpful. They're all great reads. I will link to all of them uh, in the uh, transcription below uh, when this goes live. So thank you so much. Uh, stay healthy, stay well, and uh, continued success for you. In thank you so much, right? my friend. And thanks for being so well prepared. It was a great interview. Oh, hey. Huge compliment. Appreciate it. Well, well, you know, let's just end it there. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> Thanks.